Yeah, okay. So, um, thank you for inviting us. Thanks, John, for having us over, who is not in the room yet. Um, but I'm very pleased, and Yalun and I were both very pleased to be here and talk to you about some of the things that we have thought about in terms of force field development for the charm force field. Um, and um, a lot of the ideas that I I'm going to talk about maybe old news for you um, because a lot of the stuff that we use and that we thought about are inspired by work that has been done in the context of the Open Force Field Initiative. So before I um, start, I want to give a brief outline. Um, first of all, um, I want to talk about the charm force field, the charm liquid force field, what it is, why we're interested in it and what we want to do with it. That's gonna be the part about parametrization. And then I'm going to present to you two things that um, we've already done. One is the improvement or improving the description of permeabilities in the force field. The other one is incorporating long range Leonard Jones interactions. And I think, or I hope that I'm going to um, be able to give you a taste about lipid force fields and why they are hard to do, like why, why it's hard to do a good lipid force field. So of course, lipids are the basic building blocks of biological membranes. And um, in order to simulate lipids, lipids, we have to describe a lot of interactions well between the lipids, between lipids and water, lipids, proteins, lipids and small molecules. Um, and in order to do this, we of course want to have a force field where we get, get all these um, force constants um, in the, and, or all these constants in the, in the force field, the force field parameters. Um, so that we have a reasonable description of the atomistic interactions. And um, the charm lipid force field has been the most used lipid force field over the last 10 years. Um, and since its inception in 2010 by uh, Jeff Clauder, um, it has, according to Google Scholar, over 2,000 citations. And when we think a little bit about the reasons for its, its success, um, then I think one thing is that the charm force field is a pretty general solution. So a pretty complete solution. There is a um, protein, then a DNA, lipid, and they, they all are pretty good. And then there's the charm generalized force field for small molecules. Um, I think the second reason is charm GUI, this input generator where you can generate membrane proteins embedded in membranes and all this stuff online not only for CHARM, but also for other programs. Um, and that's why I think the CHARM force fields are not only popular in the CHARM community, but also um, in people in Gromax and Amber, they, they use the CHARM force field just because it's convenient. Um, I think a, a third reason is probably its stability. Um, that's mostly thanks to the consistency and, and thoughtfulness of Alex McCrell, not letting, letting everything into the force field, but um, really having kind of a steady improvement. And the fourth reason for the charm lipid force field being popular is that it's pretty good. Like, like it does a very good job in getting many important properties right. And those are um, mostly equilibrium properties of lipid bilayers. Um, so when you are mem biological, or bilayers in biology are, are self-assembling. So, which means that they have an overall zero surface tension. Um, and when you look at the, the tangential pro pressure profile in a membrane, there's two lipids that, with the tails pointing towards each other, then um, you have that huge negative interfacial tension in the water uh, head group interface, and then a, a huge tangential pressure in the chain chain reach, uh, like in the, in the mid plane. And um, these two contributions to the ten tangential pressure have to zero out. They have to vanish in order for the membrane to be self-assembling. Um, and this is, this is, of course, depends on all the little interactions inside the membrane. It's really hard to get. Um, 
But you have to get this right in order to get, for example, the surface area of a, of a membrane right, to get the right compressibility, uh, compressibility moduli, to get good bending constants and spontaneous curvature. And the charm force field does all that, the charm bit force field does all that pretty well. Um, when we look here, um, the simulated versus experimental area per lipids for um, a lot of important lipids um, simulated that as very close to experiment. And same for the bending constants. So C36 is great. A lot of people like it. Um, why should we bother optimizing it? Um, what, and I want to talk a, li a little bit about what it doesn't do so good. Um, the first thing is that interfacial systems in general are better described by long range than a Jones detection. So dispersion interactions have an important long range effect in interfacial um, setups. And like a few years ago, or for the last couple of years, most important um, simulation programs have an efficient LJPME implementation where you can use long range and the Jones forces um, and it doesn't really hurt your speed, uh, your simulation speed. And the C36 um, force field for proteins has been validated for LJPME. So the protein force field works, um, but the, the bilayer force field, because the bilayer is so sensitive to all all these interactions. When you apply PME to a bilayer, um, you see that the surface area goes down. It's consistently down because, like for 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 different cutoff uh, distances. Um, so what we're hoping to get from LJPME PME is that this line is is um, constant, which it is. Like the surface area does not depend on the cutoff radius. That's what this long range PME should give us. When we have a usual cutoff scheme, then the surface area decreases towards that limit. Um, but the, the force field has been optimized for a cutoff distance of 12 angstrom. And you see that this is pretty good, but when, when, but when you, we take all these long range dispersion forces into account, then the force field uh, doesn't perform as good for the area per lipid and for many other important properties. So the cutoff radius is, um, is an essential parameter of the force field and we, we want to get rid of that. We want to get, get all this long range magic into, um, into the force field. Um, one more thing that is not so great is that the bilayer areas, bilayer surface areas are good, but the monolayer surface tensions are really, really terrible in the um, PME force field unless you use a long range LJPME, um, then suddenly the, uh, the monolayer areas are good, but the bilayer areas are not good anymore. So there is this, this thing, um, like an inconsistency in the force field. And there's also inconsistencies regarding Leonard Jones treatment. Um, for example, the protein force field was, was um, parameterized with a switching function between 10 and 12, the bilayer between 8 and 12, and like some lipids in the bilayer, uh, in the lipid force field also from, from 10 to 12. So there, there are some inconsistencies um, that would all go away if we get rid of all these cutoff schemes, right? So if we just say, okay, we don't want to have to do with Leonard Jones switching and with cutoff radii, um, we want to replace that by something that gives us long range dis dispersion. Um, then the, the second thing that's not good about, or maybe not so good about the charm force fields is tip 3 peak water, which we all know is a crappy water model, but it's been in there from the start and it's, we're not gonna get it out. But like, it's, it's really um, like almost every compound in the charm force field is optimized for tip 3 peak. And um, replacing it by a, a better water model is going to be a major pain. And then the third thing that we found that C36 doesn't do so well is permeability. Uh, I don't know how many of, of you have worked with uh, in the context of the sample competition. Um, yeah. But 
I mean, in permeability is, is basically a, a partitioning plus some kinetics. And like with these MM4 Swiss, we don't even get the partitioning right. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the success or the, the performance of MM-based approaches in these competitions is, is usually pretty poor. So permeability is another thing that we want to optimize that the current charm force field doesn't really get, um, and, and no MM force field really. So next I want to talk about uh, how we approach this, um, these problems. And this is very much um, intertwined with my personal history or with my personal journey in science. Um, I did undergraduate research with, uh, in, a, in a group in Germany that was mostly doing um, phosphate parameterization using automated approaches back in 2011. And um, yeah, um, <laughs> this is me back then. And then I uh, went on to do uh, graduate research in computational fluid dynamics, so something completely different. Um, but I want to talk a little bit how um, this guy viewed the world and what he thought about automatic parameterization. Um, so the, the, the consensus in our group back then was that, okay, a lot of people do the force field development by hand, and this in principle is something that is very much suited to automatic procedures. Um, so we were thinking about how can you use numerical optimization algorithms um, to improve the force field development pro uh, process. Um, and this would, like the hope is that when we do this automatically, then we can make the development much faster. We can also cancel out human error and we can um, make the force field more maintainable. So when, when, when you have the force, or when, when you have a human design the force field, um, then it, it's really hard after 10 years to go back and, and improve it. Like for example, tip 3P, it's in charm and it's, it's gonna be in charm indefinitely. Um, and when you think about this, those are a lot of the problems that we deal with in code development. So in code development, you also have this potential of human error where you make like, you introduce one bug and everything or nothing works anymore. Um, are you, where you have um, like a, a, a huge piece of software that needs to be maintained over many years and, and the software development industry has found ways around this and ways to deal with these problems. Um, and the hope is that when we automate the, the, the force development process that we can like learn, what, what can, we, can we learn from the software development industry? So what, what, I mean, basically what we used to do is we would start off with a um, set of force field parameters, run a simulation as a black box, get the observables, compare them with some reference data, and do an optimization step to um, get a pro new promising set of force field parameters. So that's like 10 years ago, or nine, nine years ago. Um, and then uh, and we, the group that I was in, used mostly gradient-based optimization algorithms um, that, that we're operating on this black box simulation. And of course, when you do this, you have to, like for each gradient calculation, you have to run a simulation. And given that the simulation is a black box for us, we have to run another simulation to get this finite difference step and to, and to calculate a partial derivative. Um, and just in order to get a gradient at a given parameter set, you have to put in so much work and what you're gonna get out of it is not like it's going to be very noisy because you think about like two um, or the statistical uncertainties on these um, on these simulation results when you calculate a gradient or finite difference between those who knows where, where this gradient is gonna gonna take you um, and what I did in my master's thesis was um, to replace the gradient-based alg algorithms by a meta-model-based algorithm. We basically say we don't want to get this local information. Instead, we predict the outcome of a simulation 
um, using everything that we know from previous evaluations or from previous simulations. Now this is still you like viewing the simulation as a, a black box, um, but we instead of having this lo local gradient, we have like a global optimization to our simulated data, and then we use these th this meta model, this predictor, to detect new promising parameters, um, and after simulating these new parameters, we have something that we have new information to enhance the meta model. So, like these two things, the meta modeling and the the um, optimization, they complement each other. Um, and then you need some kind of of sampling technique that says, okay, I have a given model of my of my um, simulation or a meta model of my simulation. How am I going to use that? to detect new promising parameters. And this worked well for, uh, for when you have very few parameters, like maybe eight to 10 uh, parameters in your force field, and it worked well for, for a few things that we did with small molecules. But um, you're not gonna get meaningful predictions for when you have a, a high dimensional parameter space. Okay, so this is a, um, like a, a small toy example, we have some some loss functional, and then we just randomly sample a few initial, initial parameters, run very short simulations for these, and then we can get like an, an idea about how our loss function looks like, how our observables looks like, um, depending on the parameters, and we can use that to sample these more promising regions of the parameter space. And remember this, like the philosophy here was simulation is a black box. Remember everything you can, build this model, and then you, you can do this faster than with gradient-based methods. And um, <clears throat> then when I started with um, Bernie and Rich in 2017, like two years ago, um, I took some of these ideas with me, but um, I was also, uh, I learned learned a lot of new things, and when I first read these, like of course a lot of a lot had happened in the years in between. And when I first read the force balance papers and the um, and the the, the M bar free energy things, that just blew my mind because like coming from that background where you have to evaluate <laughs> gradients and these finite differences, and then reading about um, hey, you don't have to run a new simulations for this. Um, and the simulation suddenly is not a black box anymore. That was, that was really huge for me um, to understand. So, uh, I mean, the basic idea, most of you will know this, is that you have a simulation trajectory that you generated in some ensemble A, which corresponds to our original parameter vector. And then you perturb your parameter vector, which gives you a new ensemble B, and so what, what we did was run new simulations for all of these um, perturbed parameters. But you can, um, when you write this as a thermodynamic dynamic average, and um, multiply this by, like, um, inter interpret this in the, in the original ensemble then you get this reweighted um, expression where you can use the original trajectory to calculate um, these partial derivatives without any more simulations. And this is dirt cheap and accurate, and as I said, probably old news to most of you. But for me, this was huge when I, when I read this two or three years ago. Um, and um, as, a, as a closing, or as a, um, summary of the, this automated optimization thoughts. Uh, when we think about numerical optimization, it's basically meta-modeling. So we can decide whether our meta-model is global or local. So basically all, when you think about a um, Newton optimization or steepest descent or conjugate gradient, you, you, you learn something about the local shape of your function, you learn the gradient, um, and you use that to get your next iteration. Um, 
And this was what this, this grow method, this final difference method did. And then we, um, what I did was um, use a, a global meta model instead and use that to do numerical optimization. Then you can, of course, do this uh, physics informed where you use reweighting as a local meta model, um, which um, force balance does, or uh, you can get the same from multi state Bennett. Um, and then the question is, how can we get a more global meta model? Because these reweighting approaches only work for small regions of the parameter space where you have good conformational overlap. How can you um, make more global predictions? And Michael Schertz group had this paper about this, about the PCFR approach. And one question is how, like, how can you maybe use information from your local gradients to construct a, a more global meta model um, without enforcing information overlap? So, kind of combining these two ideas. Okay, so with that, I want to talk about two things that we have done over the last two or three years. And the one is um, improvement of permeability description. Um, as I said in the beginning, permeabilities are basically partition coefficients plus kinetics. So we can express them through the free energy profile, like a barrier or a well through the membrane, like this, this is the membrane, and a diffusion constant. So how fast does a particle move at a given point in the membrane? Um, and with, with MMM approaches, we usually don't even get this free energy right. And we, we can't even say something about the diffusion profiles that we get because I don't think there is experimental data to support this. Um, or to, to get the same detail or same precision of, um, of information. But yeah, one thing that's important here is that the, the dominant contribution to permeability is this water oil partition coefficient. And so we, we thought about it and we thought that, okay, in order to get better permeabilities, the most important to, thing to get right is this water oil partition coefficient. And um, this is something that is going to be really hard to get in a general framework. So we thought about how can we use, or how can we develop special, um, special solutions that work for given molecules or for given permeants. Um, so one, one example of this is water partitioning into membranes. So we look, for example, at tip 3 p going from the water phase into oil, into hexadecane. And we saw, okay, the free energy of transfer is overestimated by 1k kelp per mole. Okay, tip 3 p is a crappy water model. Um, <clears throat> what happens if we use something better, like tip 3 p force balance, or tip 4 p force balance, or OPC? And it turns out the, the better the water model gets, the worse this transfer becomes. Um, and that's because this, like when, when, you, when you optimize a water model, you're explicitly optimizing it for the bulk phase. And you're, you're, you're very intentionally putting this into the optimization that, okay, we're going to describe bulk. We're, we're not like you have usually have this gas phase dipole correction. You're basically saying, I don't want to get this right. I'm not interested in water translocate um, or water translocating into um, a low dielectric phase. And so when you when you look at water permeability, it's going to be too high because you don't even like you don't even get into the oil phase as much as you would like uh, an experiment. And um, yeah, so so we thought about how what can we do about this? If this is bad for water, it's it's even worse for more complex molecules. Um, and then, oh yeah, and then sure enough, uh, so the first thing is what happens if we include polarizability? If we, if we allow the water dipole moment to relax in the hydrophobic phase, and polarizable model, water models don't have like this, this fitting, or that they're supposed to work in different kinds of environments. That, that's what polarizability is all about, right? 
that a, a molecule can respond to different electrostatic environments. When, when we looked at the partition coefficients for, um, for the swim four and swim six root water models, then this is um, almost perfect. So this is um, within, within um, experimental error. Um, and the question is, how can we get this, or can we get a similar result in an additive framework? What can we do about the additive force field? And then we developed this very crude procedure where we say, okay, say we have solubility data from experiment or from Cosmo methods or from anything that can do it better, as, uh, better than MM. And how can we use this solubility data um, to tweak um, our interactions and basically tweak um, the, or individually tweak the Leonard Jones interactions between water uh, and the solute and between alkane and the solute. The thing is that we, that we can do this very, very cheaply. So usually when we, when we calculate solubilities, we have these uh, chemical growth simulations where we have different lambda states. And then when you, when you think, um, like the, the three final lambda states give you a lot of different configurations for partially, um, partial, partially annihilated versions of the water and alkane. We can just use that as a basis to do reweighting um, and to, or we basically use these, the, the MBAR predictions from these three lambda states to generate Leonard Jones parameters between water and alkane, like pair specific Leonard Jones parameters that will um, give us the correct free energy. Um, and this, and when you use these kind of MBAR meta models, you can do this in like in a, in a day on a GPU easily. So I think this, this took us five, five hours on a single GPU, this whole optimization procedure plus one um, final simulation. Um, okay. And then we, like we did this for water and we said, okay, if it works for water, because I mean, water, alkane or water lipid interactions, um, like when, when we tweak with, when we, when we play with the water alkane interactions, then a lot of things can go wrong potentially, because the, um, as I said, the bilayer is so, um, so sensitive to these things. And if we can get water alkane right, then we probably can get everything else right as well um, in terms of the, of the permeability. And for these optimized parameters, we then measure permeabilities um, through um, some exemplary bilayers. And you can see those are the, the this is the original C, um, C36 phosphor with chips 3P. And then when we use these optimized parameters, then um, it's a little bit, or it's, it's significantly closer to experiment, but still not, or this is, this is kind of a, um, a solution, like an intermediate solution. Ultimately, you want to do this in a physically more rigorous way, um, but this uh, works and gives us the correct permeability for, the, um, for water. And, you can, and I mean, this is directly transferable to other molecules as well. Um, how am I doing on time? Yeah. Plenty of time. Okay. All right. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about this um, adapting charm to long range dispersion. How can we tweak the parameters of the charm force field to get all the things that I talked about in the beginning, right? Like the, this inconsistency between bilayer and monolayer, and um, how can we, or the, the incorporation of long range dispersion into the term force field. Um, and this, and Yalun did a lot of this work. Um, oh, the internet connection is fine. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yalun did a lot of this work. Um, and we've been working together on this for a year, for a little bit over a year. Um, 
So the objective is we want to adapt the C36 parameters to work with LJPME, and we want to get, get, get the same quality as Charm36 for the properties that Charm36 does well, which is area bullet and the, um, the SCDs, the uh, order parameters, uh, compressibility, like all these structural properties for bilays we want to retain. But at the same time, we want to achieve consistency between monolayers and bilayers. Um, and we also don't want, like, in a, in a lipid, the tail parameters are basically alkane parameters. Um, and then the head group are specific lipid parameters. Um, and we didn't want to touch the alkane because we validated that, like, we, um, Alison and Leonard um, published a paper about this last year, um, where she calculates all kinds of properties. And she consistently shows when you use LJPME, when you use long range Leonard Jones, then all these parameters become better. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into this table. Yeah, maybe, maybe, I'll sh maybe I should. This just shows how, like this is from the original C36 paper. And this shows surface tensions for C36 monolayers with the default um, settings for the charm force field. You can see that they are, they are much lower than experiment. And when you use like a, a long range uh, dispersion, then they become not perfect, but much better. Um, but this is the kind of inconsistency. So, so, so these are standard charm settings. These are non-standard settings. And we want to have a parameter set that works for the standard settings. Right? Or, yeah, for, like for, we want to have a set of parameter that works with a consistent setting for both monolayers and bilayers. Okay, so our optimization targets are the, the area per lipid um, of both monolayers and bilayers, and then the compressibility, um, because the compressibility is, is something that is directly influenced by, um, by this long range dispersion, and it's also something that, is, that can go wrong very easily, as is seen, for example, in the charm, um, in the polarizable lipid force field that has pretty good areas, but the compressibility is just not very good yet. Um, our next observable is the order parameter, which describes the torsions of all the lipid atoms in a bilayer. And then um, we, there is also experimental data for the hydration of the head group, but we don't, like we, we're, we're taking this as part of the optimization because it's cheap, we don't have to run um, a full bilayer or monolayer for that. Um, but we're also not, not weighting it so much um, because like, we know that tip 3 p is not going to do a super good job in getting all these hydration things right, all the details of the hydration right. Okay, and, <clears throat> and then we can use um, reweighting to calculate the sensitivities um, of, in this case, the area per lipid towards um, certain parameters in the simulation. So for, for the charges, um, we see that, or, oh no. so the first thing that we see is that um, it only works in a very small range for a complex system like that. And that's because when we move out of this range, we don't have enough confirmational overlap, and we'll just get basically a constant and, and very large error bars. So these, these error bars are always over three replicas of the simulation. Um, we also see that for charges and um, yeah, like for all these charges, we can change the charge quite a bit, like 0 0.01, still get a reasonable prediction and it, it stays kind of consistent. Whereas for, for um, a Lambert Jones sigma, it, it's, it's much harder because confirmational overlap or configurational overlap is more of an issue. And um, for the, the Leonard Jones well depth, um, you, it, it's, it's almost linear over a certain range. Like the sensitivities are al almost linear over, over a certain range and the, um, the prediction uncertainties are, are very consistent. Predictions are very consistent between the replicas. 
because because you're not messing with the distance, you're just messing with um, with the energy of the interactions. And then, but then the question is, how well do these MVAR or reweighting predictions um, in comparison to real simulations? So, what if we simulated with um, or when we ch if the change the parameters are simulated, and we see that in in a small range around the original parameters, the simulation and the reweighting agree very well um, for for charges, and they at least give the same trend for sigmas. So one thing that's specific for lipid force fields is that when you change change the Leonard Jones radius in this case. I think this is uh, the cardinal oxygen. Oh, this is the no, this is the phosphate oxygen. Um, and you, when you change it only by four percent or so, then you get a phase transition. Like this is one parameter in, in, in the simulation, and like the area depends. Like first of all, what's what's surprising is you increase sigma, and and the area like you increase the radius, and the area of the thing shrinks because there is no more not enough hydration between the head groups because now now the, the Leonard Jones interactions are, are taking over um, between the lipids and not so much with the water that's hydrating the head groups and then when you change it only like by five percent like one parameter is in the simulation the area goes down by ten percent and you get a phase transition in terms of like the, the li um, from the liquid crystalline phase which is very pretty mobile to, to a gel, gel phase that is that is more rigid um, and more dense. And, and something like that, you can obviously not capture by a reweighting approach. But also here you at least get this, like uh, the, the direction of, like you, you, you get an idea of in which direction parameter changes. So. Do, do you see that the effective sample size plummets as you make that change so that you can detect that the weights are all going to zero except for one weight? One snapshot. So we've been trying to find automated ways of detecting when we're too far to be able to extrapolate. Mm -hmm. And we often find that, first of all, the errors become big and then they become small again because you end up using just a few samples from your ensemble to, re to, to capture the like, extrapolated problem. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, if you find that the weights indicate that you have a very uh, small effective sample size. So we I don't think we use M bar for these calculations. We oh. just use the one side of weighting because it's basically it's just one state, thing, right? Right, because you, you're computing an effective weight of e to the minus delta g yeah. Yeah. Uh, over uh, or the you know normalizing constant. Mm -hmm. And and it, we haven't looked at that, but um, that would be the interesting. The variance of those weights would go way up, and then one yeah. of them would be uh, the very large and the rest would be small. What would be, what yeah, would be you, can, you can take a look at some what of the is that as you get to too far away, then um, it, this is just a general feature of any sort of reweighting scheme, the effective sample size plummets because just a yeah. couple of those that have the energies that are lowest at the new parameter set end up dominating by such a large energy gap. Mm -hmm. So uh, monitoring that, it turns out to be a decent way, but it's still heuristic yeah. for seeing when, when this divergence should happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, one way to think about this is it, 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 for all these reweighting methods you have, uh, you know, each sample is associated with right. weight. So instead of being one, it's the weight. Yeah, and, this is, and you this can is convert some. Yeah. Or the, this should already make us think and think like, okay, getting like these small details have such a large effect, um, and that that's kind of demonstrates why getting a good lipid force fit is hard. But um, then you have also this this very nonlinear effects. For example, um, for this for this oxygen, uh, like for this oxygen charge here, when you change the parameter or when you change the charge, then uh, the parameter doesn't uh, or the, the area of it doesn't follow linearly, but it has some some more complex complex behavior behavior. Um, and still, the reweighting gives us a, a feasible, decent, uh, decent direction for the for an optimizer. But the but the dependence between parameters and observables can be um, very, very non-trivial. Um, 
And we see that here. So when we change it, the charges by uh, 0 0.05 electric charge, electronic um, elementary charge units, then um, like a lot of different things happen. Like the, the area can 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 change up to one angst angstrom squared, um, but um, it, it's very hard to predict as a human uh, what would happen, and that's why I think at this level of fine tuning, we really need these automated uh, approaches. A question. Then, you, um, can I ask a question quickly? This, this, this is what I talked about earlier. Actually, most Lana Jones radii in the head group, when you decrease them, or when you increase the the the, the radii, then the area collapses. Or can I ask a question? Smaller. Um, and you hear me? Epsilon cube is, is the, or the, the Lena Jones Wild Labs, that's the only parameter. I uh, don't we think see kind I of consistent behavior it. among all the atom types in the head group. I, I'm not Somebody there in the room with Andreas. So we, we tried different questions. protocols. So we started off by <laughs> using uh, MBAR kind of as a global meta model and then um, add some, some kind of penalty function. Um, if if the M bar arrows were too large, uh, but th this doesn't work. It didn't work so well for the reason that we've just seen that the rebedding really is only um, good in, in a very very close region. And then the, the errors will become small, so it yeah. actually tricks you. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we had we had um, like we had the the M bar error. We also had errors from different replica yeah. replicates and. Um, but it still didn't work very well. Um, and then what we ended up with is actually quite similar similar to force balance. So, but we just get the local gradient from the reweighting. Um, we have the weights and the optimization that are chosen um, by the user, but also the uncertainty of the sensitivity plays a role in assigning these weights or in, in modifying these weights in every iteration so that we only, only um, follow the directions where we kind of know, uh, or where we are very confident that we're going to see a, 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 a um, beneficial change in the, in the parameters. Um, Can you guys hear us now? No. Yeah, this mutes both microphones if you accidentally tap it. Can I ask a question? Okay. I think we're still waiting for them to be able to hear us, Benoit. Okay. Okay. But you can hear me. Yes, yes. 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 There's a problem on their end, and messaging them about it. Are you okay to take questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So I think Benoit and Michael Schertz have questions. Mm -hmm. Can you hear us now? Do you hear me, Mike? Do you hear my question? Can you turn them on? Yeah. We're still um, working on it, Benoit. Mine is on. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Can you hear this? Testing. And we have to go to your testing. We must be muted in the room over there. Just a testing. moment. Uh, yeah. Trying to get the audio turned up. Where's your. Oh, here we go. Testing. Your audio. Testing. Output. Testing. Now we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Testing. Okay, now you got it? Yep. We yes, can you go, this? Great. So maybe Benoit can ask his question. I'll go after that. Can I talk? Okay. Uh, you, you, talk about ch you talk about changing charges, but I was not going to ask, but now you, you, you keep talking about charges. What happened when you uh, you change a charge? Do you keep you transfer like the opposite but equivalent charge uh, increment yeah. to another group to keep right. like dipoles neutrals? What do you do? Right. Yeah, I should I should have mentioned that. Like we define charge groups um, in the system to have um, right to, to keep the overall charge neutral and to keep to keep the charge. So where do you put where do you put the the, the remainder? The neighbors. Uh, to the to the neighbors to the to, to the nearest neighbors uh, in the charge group, or to the to the other uh, partners in the charge group. Okay, okay. Yeah. So when you say you change the charge of the carbonyl of the lipid, 
what you're saying is that you change the carbonyl, the carbon and the oxygen at the same time. Right. Yeah. We change the oxygen directly and then the carbon changes indirectly. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So follow up on that. You showed certain molecules had larger, smaller sensitivities. Did you look at the correlation between the charge magnitude and the change in the free energy? What, what I had observed, you know, sort of, I don't think we ever published anything on this, but there's mm -hmm. a high correlation between how sensitive it was and how large the charge was. Larger charges changed by point zero, you know, by a delta um, had a much bigger effect than smaller charges changed by the same delta. Hmm. Okay. It yeah, seems no, like be easy, easy to pull up and check that. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And, and I'm, I'm very interested in uh, where you have large, con so, so in some of the Messerly papers, there's the formula for the number of effective samples. I'm catching up on questions I missed when the mute was happening. Uh, and there, essentially, the, the way to think about it is if all the weights gets concentrated in one or two samples, that leads to a low number of effective samples. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a, a way to convert that thinking in terms of density, you know, which weights are large into, um, and which are small into a number of effective samples that works quite well. Mm -hmm. And we found that like a cutoff of 50 is where things start going haywire. Uh, and then uh, yeah, I'd be very interested on the ones like where epsilon has smooth behavior, but the trends uh, are quite different. I'd be very interested in the future to figure out what's going on in those cases. For sigma, where the configuration space overlap goes badly immediately, that's sort of expected, but it's, it's actually interesting for epsilon that the trend is not quite right, even though the uncertainty is low. Okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, because there you, you're, you would expect um, large confirmation or sufficient confirmation of configurational overlap, right? And, and I think, so, so I, I think Rich Messerly did actually see the agreement was pretty good. But th that was for, uh, for homogeneous systems, right? Yeah, yeah, so that's what I'd be interested to, to see where the difference comes in. If for some systems it works and some it didn't. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I've, I've caught up with my questions I was asking over the last 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, actually the, the, when we did the free energy fitting, uh, then um, the, we also didn't see the same, like the, 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 the sensitivities uh, for epsilon were, were top notch and uh, here not, like for the lipids, not so much. So that's, that's definitely something to look into. Very interesting, yeah. Um, then let's, let's, so we did two iterations of this protocol um, for all the atom types in the head group. And um, so this is the original C36 um, with, the, with the just PME for charges and cutoff Leonard Jones. And, uh, so we haven't evaluated the, the, the monolayer areas, but we know from the surface tangents that they are really bad. Um, and then if we use like, but, but all these, these other things agree very well with the experiment, all the, all the other um, areas uh, um, of the different bilayers. Um, and then if we uh, just use long range uh, Jones, and we get, um, a large difference suddenly, like this, a 5% or, yeah, more than 5% difference in the area of the lipids, a decrease due to these original, uh, due, due, due to these attractive long range forces. But after two iterations, we're already back at the quality of the C36 force field. And by um, using, uh, when we look at, at the monolayers, um, the monolayers also, um, give very good match with experiment. Compressi compressibility is a little worse, um, but but all the other bilayers that we tested so far look really good. And this is after two iterations. Each iteration takes like three days. We do a couple of simulations, and, um, and it's kind of it was kind of surprising to us that by doing this this linear scheme, you could get the proper or so such 
you can basically um, capture the, these nonlinear um, dependencies between parameters and observables. And this would be really hard to do for a human without this kind of um, without this kind of um, tool. I mean, Jeff did it, but like, I I wouldn't be able to do it. I'm sure. Um, so then, when we look at the order parameters, when we like those are the, um, the red dots are the experiments for the two chains, and in the head group region, and uh, those are pretty good for the original C36. But then when we use LJPME, it's all um, it's all over the place. And then again, after two iterations, we have the same uh, we have basically the same accuracy as the original force field, and in the head groups, it's even better. Um, right. And I talked a little bit about having this regularization term where we basically have C36 as a target in the optimization, um, which is very moderately weighted, but which um, prevents overfitting. Um, and by that reweighting, you can see that the, that the modifications on the final parameters are, are actually pretty minimal. So charges change not more than 0.1 um, elementary charge units, and the sigmas don't change more than 0.1 angstrom. Um, and so far, everything thing we've seen in terms of, of observables looks really good. Uh, so far for the PC head group, but we're going to do um, the other, other head groups too. So I think we finally have a parameter set for the triangle before so that works for long range and domes and for, uh, for monolayers and bilayers. Um, and then I want to just spend maybe three or four minutes talking about where we're going with this. So the first thing is that when we, um, when we, when we have force fields that are editable, like that's, that's the dream, right? Like we want a force field that we can, that we can improve at any point in time. But um, as I said before, one, one um, aspect of the charm force field that makes it popular is that it's been stable and that it's been good for many, many decades or many years and, uh, and decades. And um, so how can, we, how can we get both? Like a reliability for people to, to trust in a force field, but on the other hand, keep it maintainable and keep, um, enable editing, not like the tip three water model that's like in there, we're never gonna get it out. Um, and, and I think one way to achieve this is continuous integration. And I don't know how much you have thought about this, but I think if, if we develop force fields that we can edit in the future, um, then we have to think about how, we, how are we going to um, make people trust in the force fields. Um, and one way to do this would just be a, a continuous integration framework where we have a repository where we save the final trajectories so that we can do reweighting on these trajectories easily and integrate new observables. Where we have the sensitivities saved so that if people want to add new simulations to parameterize against that we still have the sensitivities from the old simulations to guide the optimization and um, prevent everything else or the previous optimization from being in vain. Um, and also have the fitting script, all that in line, where we can basically ensure everybody can look at the results online, everybody can use um, our trajectories and, and our fitting procedure, um, but at the same time, we make sure that the old, the, the, or the, the, the observables that we originally parameterized for doesn't, um, don't screw up in the process. I think this is a, an objective that we share for the Open Force Field Initiative. In fact, if we can assume some of the infrastructure burden for being able to do this for a wide variety of force fields through something like our property estimator, which automates the computation of a lot of these observables, maybe not the ones that you have yet, but uh, I think that would be fantastic to have a web framework that allows us to look at how are all of these different force fields doing on these kinds of physical quantities that are measurable. And then um, the, the idea that you mentioned of being able to deploy the the trajectories as well would be great. The trajectories can sometimes be very large. So at least too the, large for a GitHub repository. But at least the ability to regenerate them and cache them locally if you want to do this exploration locally is something that we should support as well with this infrastructure. Yeah. So I, I think we should definitely talk about how we can do enable that for the community. Yes. Okay, and then, then finally, just as um, 
just to say what we are going to um, do with this. So um, in the long term, we want to talk, we want to optimize also the jute force field. The jute lipid force field is not in such a great state at the moment um, in terms of the compressibilities, for example, and um, we're going to try to use, or we want to, to, to use this approach um, for the polarizable charm force field as well, so that we can have a longer term solution to improve the description of permeabilities. And we also have this equivalent formulation of the Drude model, um, a multipolar induced dipole model. I should have put the citation here that's um, uh, Jing Huang published this two years ago, uh, which has basically um, it's a translation of Jude into a multipole induced dipole framework, but gives a little bit more flexibility in terms of the choice of parameters. Um, and that's also something uh, Bernie is very much uh, interested in. Um, so, so these are going to be the things that we're going to work on um, over, the, over the next uh, couple of years. Um, and Yalun is, is going to play a big part in that. And um, with this, I want to come to the conclusion. So, we first seen this automated approach to improve the description of the permeabilities, where we can use multi-stage reweighting as kind of a global meta model. And then we have used similar methods to adapt C36 to Leonard Jones PME, um, where we use reweighting as a local meta model, very much like force balance, um, where only in only two iterations we get to a force field um, that so far gives us everything that we want from, from, a, from a lipid force field. Um, but more things to test, of course. And that finally has consistent parameter settings for bilayers and monolayers. With this, I um, want to thank everybody who contributed to this work, uh, mostly Yalun, who has done a big part of the uh, lipid refitting uh, project. Um, and I want to thank you all for your attention. I think we can take questions. Yeah. Does anyone have questions like in our, I think. I have a question. Yeah, yeah please do. Just, just to, uh, to really understand what happened. So when you run the old charm force field with the sort of 12-ish Einstrom cutoff, Mm -hmm. The area upper lipid, let's say for DPPC, was something like 63 angstrom square, I think. 62.9, that's what you have in mm -hmm. the table, I think. Mm -hmm. And then when you turn on this uh, PME Leonard Jones, it dropped to about 58. That's right. And then by adjusting Leonard Jones and partial charges for basically any atom or just a few atoms i don't i'm so sure i mean, I mean how many parameters were changed you basically go back up to about 63 angstrom that is right yeah we we train on every atom in the head group um and the reason for this is that most of these parameters are very heuristic like the partial charges um are not like the, the derivation of the partial charges in the head group is not very systematic. It's, it's a little bit of trial and error um, for, for many of these charge, charges. And um, one other thought or line of thought was that when we distribute the burden of, of capturing this um, overall parameters in the head group, then we can get away with very small changes and thereby hopefully also ensure compatibility with the protein force field, for example. And I think that, like, from what we see in the parameters, that they, that they change so little, the final parameters, we can hope that we still get um, good interaction between the lipid and the, force field, uh, and the protein force field, for example. I see. So you, you changed also the carbons between the uh, glycerol backbone and the phosphate, like there are a couple of aliphatic carbon type. You, uh, you don't change just the phosphate and the... Uh, you know, the very polar group, right? You change like all the carbons in between? Yeah, we, we change the link atoms between the phosphate and the, and the choline, for example, yeah. Okay, but you don't change the dihedrals or you adapt the dihedrals? Yes, we do, we do adapt the dihedrals. Um, so we have, we tried out different approaches for this. What we're going for uh, now is that 
um, a lot of the dihedral distributions we fit to the C36 distributions because we know that they are pretty good. Um, and that's a very doable approach. And that's also in the spirit of not deviating too much from the original force field. Um, so we're, we're readjusting the dihedrals to give the same distributions as C36 if possible. But distribution have, mean distribution in the simulation? Right, in the, in, in the bilayer simulation. So, okay, okay, so you calculate like the distribution of the dihedral in the C36 with 12 angstrom cutoff. And then right. you try to maintain those dihedral distribution? Exactly. Except in, the, except in the cases where we definitely know a better answer from the SED or from QM, and we uh, have a trustworthy or, or, or a more trustworthy reference um, than C36, except we um, like, but, but for most of the dihedrals, we, we, we fit them to C36. I see. I see. It may be, I mean, it's very interesting. The, the, um, it may be that the, the, uh, the tweaking of partial charges would have to be looked at in a maybe in slightly different light in the case of the Drew force field because all the charges have been fitted from ab initio to begin with. Yeah. Small change probably are still acceptable, but they, they're not as heuristic as charm 36 charges. Right. So, so it would be in, like one first step for the Drude force field would be to look at uh, the reweighting for both the polarizabilities and for the charges and to see like which is more, which of these two is more sensitive and uh, what do we, um, like if the one is heuristic then the other is not, right? So I, I believe in, in, the, in the lipid force field you, you did the uh, chart the partial charges from ab initio, that, but then you had heuristic information for the polarizabilities, right? Well, the polarizability came from ab initio too, but they they are a little bit more uh, they're adjusted more empirically to some extent too. At the end of the day, like you know, to get dielectric constant right and things like that. So right. the, the 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 charges are a little bit more uh, restrained by the ab initio. The polarizability a little bit less. They're also extracted from ab initio, but. But if we can get away with, with changes in the same order of magnitude, like, for example, yeah. uh, point 0.1 electric start, uh, char uh, elementary charge unit, that's like um, probably also acceptable for something that is fit to up an issue. Yeah, just, uh, just to finish here, it, I think that uh, we, we highly suspect that the, the uh, incompressibility of the bilayer with the Drude force field comes from the polar red polar red interaction. And mm -hmm. uh, that probably would have required doing some sort of osmotic pressure measurement or something like that to really quantify how much the, uh, like for example, the choline binds to the phosphate and things like that. This was, this was a bit unanticipated, but this kind of uh, uh, problem between charged species has, has been observed more regularly, like between arginines and aspartic acid, like a lot of uh, the very charged <coughs> stuff has required a second look afterward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Okay, thank you. But we're, we're, we're definitely gonna be in touch about, about this effort, at the very least. Any other questions? No? Well, there are no questions here in the room. I, now we can hear you on the Zoom. I apologize for that. I checked it, like if you can hear us, but not if we can hear you. So um, sorry about that. But if there are no questions, I think we can finish. With you. Thank you so yeah. much, Andreas, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you all for the